I'm Eloy Ortiz Oakley, President and CEO of College Futures Foundation, and you're invited to Opportunity Forum with College Futures. Hi, I'm Eloy Ortiz Oakley, and I'm here today with Tui Nguyen, former legal counsel to the California Community College's Chancellor's Office and a former community college president. Tui is currently a partner at the law firm of Garcia, Hernandez, and Sani. I'm also joined by Jesse Ryan, executive vice president for the Campaign for College Opportunity. Jesse's organization is a leading voice on equity in higher education here in California. Thank you both for taking the time to be with us and welcome to Opportunity Forum with College Futures. Thank you, Eli. I'm so honored to be with two racial equity warriors. Likewise, uh, thank you, Eli, for the invitation. It's great to have you both and it's good to see uh, old friends. Uh, so let's begin um, before we jump into the Supreme Court decision on race conscious admissions, let's take a step back to November 5th, 1996. And I know um, for many of us who have grown up in California, that's still a fresh memory. Um, and even before 1996, back to 1995, when an infamous, infamous UC regent um, uh, pushed for the passage of SB1 and SB2, which began us down this road of ending the use of race in, in admissions here in California. So help us tweet, uh, particularly for our audiences who may not be very familiar with Prop 209 or California law, give us a quick overview of the law and, and its ramifications here in California. Well, as you know, Prop 209 was a statewide initiative. And so when it was voted on, uh, the it essentially changed the uh, state's constitution. And it says, um, and I quote, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin. And what's critical, it's in three areas, three operational areas, public employment, public education or public contracting. And for California community colleges, all three uh, apply to us. Um, so essentially Prop 209 eliminated racial quotas, racial preferences. It eliminated ref racial preferences, for instance, in college admissions to the UC system. And that's why in the um, UNC Harvard uh, Supreme Court admissions case recently, uh, mm -hmm. the UC system filed an amicus brief to express how Prop 209 affected its uh, student demographics. Um, what is uh, especially important is um, is how the uh, what we learned from what happened in California with Prop 209 uh, is also very telling of what we can learn in terms of the Supreme Court decision. But I know we mm -hmm. could uh, talk about more of that. Right, and we will. But before we jump into that, I also want to ask the two of you, where were you on your journey uh, when Prop 209 passed in, 96, in 1996? And what were your initial reactions and thoughts? Let's start with you, Jesse. So Eloy, you are taking me way back. Um, I'm certainly <laughs> a trip down memory lane, but not a good memory. Um, right. I will tell you, I had just graduated from high school. And, you know, as someone who was low income, first generation, being raised by a struggling single mother, you know, having experienced homelessness, having experienced mm -hmm. food insecurity, I knew uh, that the playing field was never level. And when Prop 209 was being proposed, um, that was actually my first uh, attempted advocacy. I mm -hmm. ended up as a newly graduated high school student um, going out and being a precinct leader to try and defeat Prop 209. And I was a precinct leader in the conservative Central Valley of all places. I had gone to <laughs> eight schools from kindergarten through high school and i had really seen education inequity firsthand and i still remember to this day knocking doors in central valley precincts trying to compel people to understand that we couldn't just say that you know merit 
would in fact create an equal society. We had to recognize that so many individuals have never been given an opportunity to reach their full potential. And that this move towards Prop 209 would have a chilling effect and in fact staggering implications for students of color and for women for decades to come. And I remember crying when Prop 209 passed and really um, committing to my lifetime of work to try and undo racial injustices. Well, I know looking back at that time, so many of today's equity advocates came from that era and were fueled during that era. So I'm hopeful that this SCOTUS decision will also fuel a whole new generation of equity advocates. Uh, Twee, let me ask you about your journey and what were your reactions at the time? Uh, well, you are absolutely right in terms of advocacy, very similar to Justy's story. Um, my first year of law school class, my first year class at UCLA Law School was actually the first year of the implementation of SB1, SB2, that precursor mm -hmm. that you were talking about uh, of Pro to Prop 209. Well, my class was about 380 students, and we had five Black students and 12 Latino students. Mm -hmm. uh, it was I was one of the students coordinating rallies to voice the detrimental effects of Prop 209. And I asked my classmate, one of the five Black students, to come to the rally and talk about how racially isolating it was for her. I remember her saying to me, Twee, the best thing I could do for the cause is to study and stay in school. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I drop out, our class will lose 20% of its Black students. Wow. Um, uh, it 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 was quite telling. So we 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 were able to channel her voice, but definitely I said, take care of your business because your business is ours too. We care about your uh, your success. Um, you know, Eloy, when you think about it, uh, we have many faculty, classified professionals, and administrators who have been working in the California community colleges for less than twenty five years. Right. That means many of our people in the community colleges. Um, they only have been operating under Prop 209. And, mm -hmm. and, and so the, the effects of it is very real um, in terms of our system. And so the ability uh, to take the opportunity with this recent SCOTUS decision to reflect on Prop 209 is just so apropos of you to do. So let's begin to leave November 5th of 1996, and let's fast forward to June 29th of 2023. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States, otherwise known as SCOTUS, ruled on two cases, one involving Harvard and one involving the University of North Carolina, in which it curtailed the use of race in college and university admissions. Jesse, let me start with you. Uh, we know that a lot of critics have said that post-secondary institutions consider race and race proxies in ways that uh, exacerbate equity gaps in our higher education systems. For example, we've heard a lot about legacy admission practices and they've been under quite a bit of fire and they should be under fire over this last year. Where else have you seen this? And has there been anywhere in our, our public systems here in California where you've seen something similar? Yeah. So, you know, I have to tell you, and this is where I, I continue to have rigorous debates with individuals in the field because, we know from the 27 years post Prop 209's passage that there has been no sufficient proxy for race, no sufficient proxy in terms of producing equitable outcomes. And yet, you know, we have all of these practices that have lived on that have favored the wealthy and well-connected. Right. And you've touched upon a few of them. We know that legacy admits, that donor admits, in fact, um, account for at campuses like USC and Santa Clara, about 14 percent of admission wow. from the freshman class. Astonishing. Right. We know that when we put in place admissions practices like early admission or demonstrated interest, it favors students and families that understand how to work the system. And again, um, you know, further creates and perpetuates the divides for students who have traditionally been left behind. With our public colleges and universities, we often point to the UC system and the proxies that they put in place post-packaging 
passage of Prop 209 to ensure a more equitable admissions process. And you know, they started off with 14 different proxies for race. Mm -hmm. Again, none yielded the outcomes that we would want to see. And we saw a devastating decline from 95 to 98 in the admissions of Black, Latinx and our Native American students. Then as the UC started to pioneer this holistic review process that was supposed to be more comprehensive in terms of accounting for both the academic markers, the student experiences, the whole student, if you will, we saw some improvements. But let's be clear, we have never returned to our pre Prop 209's passage, our affirmative action, um, you know, statistics that allowed us to really open the doors of opportunity for students across the state. Um, one of the things that we continue to say at the Campaign for College Opportunity with our public colleges and universities is that in many ways, admissions are done under the hood. We don't have a sense with transparency of right. what campuses are doing. And so even the exemplars, if you will, like the UC system have uneven implementation. We don't know how holistic review varies from one campus to the next. And so especially now, as we see this egregious decision by the Supreme Court, we're gonna have to do more to demand that we are elevating the evidence-based in high impact practices that we know serve students of color across the state. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, Tui, let me turn to you. Um, when I first asked you to be part of this conversation, uh, one of your responses was that you had much concern about the chilling effect caused by the SCOTUS decision. Tell us more about what you mean by that. Well, there's been scholarship in this area, and they call it repressive legalism. So <laughs> typically, when people are dealing with new legal restrictions, uh, research shows that they tend to go into a swirl of dialogue and risk analysis, and right. then it creates a chilling effect far beyond the law's requirement. Um, and so as a result, it, 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 there's over-interpreting, over-correcting, uh, many times out of fear, right? So I say this because I have witnessed this phenomenon myself. So just a few years after Prop 209 passed, the state proposed to eliminate state funding for K-12 voluntary integration and court-ordered desegregation programs, uh, believing that Prop 209 no longer allowed school districts to do these racial integration programs. That's not true. And so I had to help lead a coalition of school districts to save the funding, informing mm -hmm. legislators that Prop 209 did not prohibit school integration. Um, my report uh, that, um, you know, that we'll talk about the equitable protection principle is about, uh, you know, talks about the voluntary integration program at Berkeley Unified School District. And I was part of the legal team at that time uh, to help the school district design their program. Uh, the school district was sued. Um, it won the lawsuit, uh, whereby the court said that district's race conscious integration program did not violate Prop 209. Now, fast forward a little bit, even as of late, when I was interim general counsel for the state chancellor's office, uh, mm -hmm. leading the charge on the EO changing funding allocation model, you may recall this, right. uh, changing it from the FTS mo model to the nine multiple method model. And our main pur purpose for me was for faculty diversity. Well, with the infusion of dollars, we had a real opportunity. And yet some of our own folks, our trustees, were afraid to even say the word diversity mm -hmm. in fear of violating Prop 209. So, um, and we see that effect already uh, with the conversations um, on the SCOTUS decision, uh, concerns of now around scholarships, concerns mm -hmm. around financial aid, uh, outreach, uh, et cetera, um, and, and even concern about whether to use words like underrepresented students, uh, et cetera, because mm -hmm. of fear of, of, of of lawsuits. And so I, I think the, the the chilling effect is very real. And so that's why it's also really important that we speak uh, clearly about it. It's also, um, we need to watch for this. Um, and for people who are in positions of influence, we should provide information and inspiration 
to help ward off this chilling effect. Um, the USC Race and Equity Center, and I intentionally published my report immediately after the SCOTUS decision to help ward off this chilling effect. And with the new school year starting, we need to do another big and bold messaging to ward off that chilling effect. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And particularly since um, we here in California have been working through this dark tunnel for quite some time, we should be the example for the rest of the states in this country of how not to pull back and, and the challenges that occur when there is this chilling effect, because we certainly experienced that after 1996. Now, Jesse, um, uh, building on Twee's um, answer and uh, comments she made about the chilling effect, um, you're in an advocacy organization. Do advocates have a role in keeping decision makers from being stymied by this chilling effect that Twee mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Tui, I, I just want to say I, I so appreciate everything that you have just said. I mean, we have to be louder than ever. We have to question conservative interpretation of the legal decision in a more vocal and full-throated manner than we ever have before. And we have to ensure that we have racial equity-minded leaders in every institution across the country, right? That when vacancies open, we are doing everything in our power to ensure that those positions are filled with people who will have the courage mm -hmm. to question conservative interpretation of the SCOTUS decision and to push for racially just and diverse campus communities. Um, I will say, Eloy, one of the things that I always appreciated about your leadership is whether you were the president of Long Beach City College or the chancellor of the community college system, you were constantly questioning others when they would say we couldn't do something based on Prop 209. You would argue that it was not a catch up so that we would, in fact, deny our moral obligation to diversity, right? And I think as advocates, we now have to ensure that we're not just, you know, putting out messages that say your language matters and we will be watching closely as campuses interpret and then implement policy and practice changes as a result of the SCOTUS decision. But we're actually also going to be analyzing your data so that if we see, in fact, you have swung that pendulum too far to the other side, we are going to challenge the fact that you are no right. longer admitting the diverse class student classes of students that we know you could be admitting with less conservative interpretation. I also want to touch upon another piece of this chilling effect. I mean, we know that the legal interpretation tends to skew conservative. We know that we have a lot of individuals in the field that, you know, when a decision of this magnitude happens, start to become a little risk adverse. And I do think that our advocates have this very important role in keeping those leaders honest. Um, I also think we have an opportunity to bring together bright legal minds, as we are doing at the Campaign for College Opportunity, across the country that can say, language matters and we want to be clear that this decision is specific to race conscious admissions we say this continually because especially as we're talking about the implications for the rest of the country when people say this is a ban on affirmative action we then start questioning every other facet of ensuring mm -hmm. diverse inclusive communities including recruitment retention scholarships and that is absolutely unacceptable acceptable. I also just want to say on this chilling effect, you know, we can't discount the student experience. We've right. talked a lot about the legal aspects of the decision and Prop 209. But, you know, part of the chilling effect is that at a time when students are questioning whether they are going to pursue their college dreams and questioning the value of college, when we have a ruling like the SCOTUS ruling, we see students across the country and certainly here in California that begin to wonder, do they belong 
on campus communities? Are they valued? Are they wanted as key parts of our college community? And I think this was reflected for me in my own backyard. We actually had taken um, my son and my daughter who identify as black to University of North Carolina the week <laughs> before the decision. We were actually in the area um, the weekend of Father's Day. Uh, my, my husband had wanted to go see a, a Durham, a Bull Durham, uh, baseball game and we ended mm -hmm. up going and doing a tour of UNC and my kids were blown away. I mean, they were talking about everywhere we went on campus, you know, the students looked like me. This is a place I could see myself, my 11 year old son in particular. Um, and when we got the news about the SCOTUS decision banning race conscious admission, my son Tristan and his cousin Nolan were together and their first question as we were listening to the radio in the car is does this mean that kids like me black kids aren't going to have an opportunity to go to colleges like North Carolina and I had to say you know Tristan like this is a really hard and complicated conversation but you know you need to understand that this does mean that we are not recognizing your value in the same way. And it's going to be a little harder for you to be able to walk through those doors. And that is not a conversation that anyone should have to have with their children. And so the most important thing I think we can be doing as advocates and as allies is saying you belong, there's a place for you, and we're gonna do everything in our power to remove barriers to your access. So speaking of those barriers, Tui, let's turn our attention to you. You've talked about the framework that you've developed called the Equitable Protection Principle, and it speaks to how community colleges specifically can make progress toward racial equity in today's legal climate. Tell us more about it. Well, you know, we talk about the chilling effect many times is out of fear, and that mm -hmm. fear comes from risk analysis. And so being able to inform and educate people as they do the risk analysis of how much um, the work can still be done. And when I talk about the work, I talk about race conscious, racial equity work, right? Um, right. In many ways, the equitable protection principle framework uh, is a, sort of a next iteration of my legal memo guidance that I wrote on EEO when I was interim uh, general counsel for the state chancellor's office. Uh, combined now with my experience as a college president doing racial equity work, I found myself thinking of all the tools in the toolbox that mm -hmm. I wanted to share with my friends and colleagues in our community college system. Uh, but instead of just offering a tool here, a tool there, I wanted to organize the tools uh, into a framework um, for our community colleges colleagues to use. Um, I, I, I call it the, my dear colleague, my dear community college <laughs> report letter. And the framework is also useful actually for K-12 UC, CSUs and other public entities in California because it talks about Prop 209. And that it has two frames. One is the legal frame and the other is the public policy frame. And the legal frame, I basically uh, d describe how even California courts have stated that race conscious and it, at, at times racial um, uh, remedy focus uh, policies are allowable under Prop 209. And so I speak to how it's possible, what you can do, and the uh, legal framework to do that kind of work. Um, then the public policy frame is around uh, looking at public policy, policy strategies, procedures, practice programs, and think about it um, at a structural level, cultural level, and at the individual level. And how do you do anti racism work using those types of thought process to dig deep. And then I really appreciate um, the work that you have been doing because you have, uh, as a member of the uh, regents for the UC system, uh, you have been really pushing to question uh, the SAT, for instance, right? And, you know, to do that kind of work, has real power uh, in terms of promoting racial diversity. And yet uh, that kind of work would not be called uh, affirmative action, right? So mm -hmm. what is it? It is the anti-racism work looking at things at the structural level, right? So, right. you know, we, we have 
um, we, you mentioned earlier around how uh, there's now pressure on Harvard and similar universities. Jesse mentioned um, Santa Clara and others to re-examine their legacy policy program, for instance. So the question is, what are the legacy-like programs for California community colleges? Let us right. courageously re-examine our own version of legacy laws and policies at the structural, cultural, and individual. And some of these policies may be considered sacred in our system part of our college culture, academic traditions, yet could be real racial barriers for our students. Right. Absolutely. So, Jesse, in your conversations with policymakers, decision makers, leaders at all levels, what are you sharing about how to move forward and where they should be spending their time to close racial equity gaps? Well, I will tell you, I mean, one of the first things we're saying is now is not the time to be a bystander. Right. Now is the time to be an upstander. And and I think one of the things that we have seen um, to some of the policy remedies and systemic structural changes that we know have to occur is that policymakers can be at the forefront of leading some really transformational change. I think you might have read recently that Assemblymember Ting, in response to the SCOTUS decision, said, I'm going to introduce a bill that is going to say that for colleges that continue to employ the legacy admissions and donor admissions, they will be denied access to financial aid. Right. So there are things we can do that are very hard hitting in the face of what we have before us. I would argue to Tui's point, I think we're beyond examining these practices. I think we know the racially stratified outcomes of these practices. I think we are now at a place where based on the 27 years of data we have post Prop 209, the nine states that have eliminated a affirmative action and the repercussions of those decisions, that we have a good set of tools in terms of saying, this is what we need to do away with. And here are the investments and efforts that we need to double down on. So, you know, you mentioned earlier the elimination of testing, SAT and ACT testing. I would argue mm -hmm. we don't need to be examining whether or not we should go test optional in the same way we don't need to be examining whether or not legacy admissions are necessary mm -hmm. anymore. I think we need to commit to do away with SAT and ACT. I think we need to commit to do away with racially unjust policies that favor the wealthy and well-connected. I think we also need to recognize that, and Eloy, I think you say this more beautifully than anyone, that community colleges more now than any other time before are a beacon of light for all students, right? 80% of our students will start their college journeys at a community college. And so at the same time, we're looking at removing barriers to access for four-year universities. We need to be more intentionally diving in to providing seamless pathways in our community college systems to transfer to universities because we know that that's a critical backdoor to diversity and probably one of the strongest tools we have in our toolkit to ensure that more Black, Latinx, Native American students are going to four-year universities and graduating in timely fashion. And we know, and you've been a champion for many of the practices, what we can do to better support that. But I think at the same moment, we need to figure out how are we ensuring that we are targeting aid to our needy students, both to help uh, mitigate some of the chilling effect that we will feel with our students and families, and to ensure that we're removing that barrier of college affordability as students question whether or not they should be pursuing their dreams. Absolutely, and amen to all of that. Now, as we begin to wrap up, let me ask a couple of closing questions, and, and let me start uh, with you, Jesse. Uh, can you share more about the Campaign for College Opportunities, Affirming Equity, Ensuring Inclusion, and Empowering Action Initiative? Absolutely. So, you know, Eloy, the 
affirming equity, ensuring inclusion, and empowering action initiative was born um, about a year ago in response to what we saw as a real gap in the field. We saw that there were some tremendous legal scholars, bright minds across the country, preparing a legal response to an unfavorable SCOTUS decision. But where a critical gap remained was in providing tools to institutional leaders and messaging that could help combat a ban on race conscious admissions. So what you see in the campaign we've launched is a pretty comprehensive approach to ensuring that we are supporting the field and in particular supporting our students and doubling down on an unapologetic racial equity focus in these critical times. We have combined a series of meetings with some of the uh, best research minds across the country and an expert advisor board with a set of policy papers that we are putting out on what we think are some of the most critical issues that will be facing students and institutions moving forward, looking at everything from equitable admissions practices, things like direct admissions, um, and looking at eligibility in the local context and top percent, everything from ensuring equitable preparation, things like A through G for all, ensuring FAFSA completion for all high school students, dual enrollment and dual enrollment that doesn't favor white students or middle class students, but has mm -hmm. equity frameworks baked in. We're also um, doing a series of policy briefs on student pathways, equitable financing, and some really critical conversations around how institutions can foster campus communities that in fact support a feeling of belonging for students and representation from faculty and administrators that reflects the diversity of the students they serve. So look for those papers in the coming weeks and months. We've actually released our first series, which is specifically looking at admissions, things like the legacy admissions, donor mm -hmm. admissions, and early admissions, a holistic review as well. We hope that your uh, listeners will, will download those reports. They have some really good recommendations for policymakers and institutional leaders. We'll be turning all of these papers into toolkits, which will be distributing widely with our coalition partners, our education leaders, institutions themselves. And then we're continued to be in conversation with the Department of Education and the White mm -hmm. House. You know, we are appreciative of the Dear Colleagues letter that they put out, and yes. we hope that they will go further. Um, and, and what we mean by that is, again, not just examining inequitable practices, but taking a stance that we should be doing away with those practices we know have disproportionate impacts. Well, speaking of important tools, uh, let me give you the last word, Twee. Uh, the Equitable Protection Principle is out now and available for download on the USC Race and Equity Center website. So everyone should go to that website and download the report. Any parting words that you'd like to share about the work ahead from your point of view? Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for the invitation, uh, inviting me to your opportunity forum. It's uh, quite a way to title it. Definitely, there are opportunities for us to do the work and and the campaign for college opportunity. Jesse, I've always been an admirer of your work and your organization's work. In fact, my report speaks to uh, saying that uh, our system needs to take a look at the work of no advocacy nonprofit organizations like yours and so many other for the research, for the examination, the data that you've been doing. Uh, for instance, the work on AB 705 has been just so uh, changing, life changing for our students. Um, my report very much is to speak to uh, our system and the people in our system. Uh, one thing I have discovered in my work is there are many talented people in our system, uh, but courage comes at, unfortunately, at a very rare uh, moment. Mm -hmm. And and the courage to be able to self-reflect, uh, to examine one's own work, sometimes even undoing what 
we personally have been doing for years. Um, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, and, and, and so I'm hoping that uh, through the report, I, I offer some uh, thoughts and ideas, including saying, listen to folks like the Campaign for College Opportunity, uh, to uh, wonderful people like uh, Eloy Oakley and others. Um, the other is also the term affirmative action has different meanings for different people, and it right. has evolved significantly since the 1960s when it was first created. And so that's why I, I've been talking to a lot of people, uh, and I find myself thinking uh, that a different terminology may be needed uh, to reflect mm -hmm. what really is being done, uh, because the work, many of the work that you're talking about is not under the rubric of even the term uh, affirmative action. And so uh, to do it today, looking at it at an anti-racism lens while complying with the legal requirements, and that's why I offered the term equitable protection principle for California to stay within the rubric of Prop 209, the legal court decision interpretation of it, uh, while doing things in an equitable way um, and, and, and kind of mirroring uh, the United States uh, Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause. So, um, so my last parting word is always a parting word that I start and I part with for my colleagues at the California Community Colleges is that the unexamined life is not worth living and the unexamined system is not worth perpetuating. And it takes courage for us to examine ourselves. Well, on that word of courage, I want to thank both of you for your courage and for continuing your advocacy for all of these years. And now, more important than ever, that um, we continue to highlight um, your advocacy, your thoughts, your recommendations for how we move forward. So I really appreciate the two of you taking time to be with us. As I begin to sign off, I'm going to take a personal point of privilege, uh, since this is the Opportunity Forum with College Futures. I'm going to say a few parting words um, that uh, I was inspired to say because of my two guests. First of all, we are in the great state of California. We have post-secondary institutions that have, throughout the last several years, been willing to examine themselves, been willing to raise difficult questions, and been willing to use the words diversity, equity, and inclusion in a forward-facing way, not shying away from it in light of the political rhetoric that is uh, strangling our country. We have a responsibility to move forward, to lean forward at a time like this. We have gone through this dark tunnel beginning in 1996, and we've come out a stronger state because of it, a stronger post-secondary system because of it. And so I, I look to the leaders of all of our post-secondary systems, whether they be the California Community Colleges, the California State University System, the University of California, and all of our wonderful private post-secondary institutions here in California, to use this moment in time to lean forward. We here at College Futures, We'll be watching and supporting those who show the courage to lean into this moment and support this narrative, not to shy away from it, but to lean into it. So I want to thank my two guests and all the people working throughout California and this nation to take this moment as a time of leadership and as a time to move our country forward. So with that, I want to thank Twee and Jesse again for joining me here on this episode of the Opportunity Forum with College Futures, a conversation space with innovators and influencers in and around higher education, working to help students move onward and upward. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, and we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us.